well. So there we go. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for what is the first Café Scientifique of 2021. I'm sure along with you guys, we all hope it's going to be a better year than 2020. And I think what better way to start the year than with uh, another wonderful presentation. This evening we have uh, Peter Constable, who's a professor in the Department of uh, Biology at UVic. And uh, also one thing I'd love to ask you about, Peter, at the, the end here is your role as Director of Center for Forest Biology at UVic as well. But uh, this evening, Peter's going to be talking to us about plant power, using plants as biochemical factories in the fight against the COVID pandemic. All right, take it away, Peter. Thank you very much. Okay, all right. Um, everybody can still hear me okay? And you can see me okay? Yep, everything's great. Great, all right. Well, thanks, thanks uh, John, for the invite and, and the introduction. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very nice to be here and um, to have the opportunity to speak to, to you all. Um, I can't see anybody. I'm assuming there's a, at least a good number of you out there. Um, I'm talking to you from my office um, via this, this setup, so it's all very odd, but amazingly how we've all gotten used to this, and I just finished a whole term of teaching like this, and uh, it just seems almost normal. So I hope you're all able to hear me okay, and, uh, and um, we'll just go, go ahead. Um, I'm, a, I'm a plant uh, molecular biologist and plant biochemist, um, so I, it's actually really kind of, you know, I almost surprised myself by thinking that I'm here talking about COVID and the pandemic because it's really kind of far away from what I normally think about and do. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll also tell you up front that, you know, I'm an expert in plants, not so much on viruses and public health, um, but I have learned quite a bit uh, over the last uh, last few months. Um, but really, I'm going to be telling you today about the um, the plant side of things and really the, the you know, the, um, I'll try to convince you of the amazing biochemical power of plants and how we're trying to use it and how we're thinking about using it against um, this, you know, this fairly nasty virus and this, you know, this uh, very, you know, big pandemic. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few general principles and ideas. Um, and really, most, mostly what I want to do is lead up to the, to the work that we're doing um, right here at UVic in, in my lab. Um, and um, this is where I wish I could see myself in the screen, but I hope, I hope you guys can see this and you'll have to just speak up, John, if not. But this is that little, this is a little plant. It's a, it's a relative of the tobacco plant. It's called Nicotiana bentamiana. And um, this is what we're using to try to, um, act, to produce spike protein, part of the viral proteins um, that can then be used ultimately we hope in test kits or other other kinds of applications that we can uh, apply against the epidemic. Um, we're very early on in this, I'll tell you up front, and when I when I agreed to this talk I thought we'd be further ahead in the actual research, but we're making some progress. Um, so either, if, you know, so whatever we learn, um, if we can't apply it in this pandemic, I think there'll be other opportunities to make to make use of, of, uh, of our results. Um, the, the advantage of using plants like this, we know how to grow plants, um, and the whole premise of this project is that if we can get plants to make important proteins, we can scale up very, very easily and cheaply, and so we could make huge amounts of protein um, with, that has, has a direct uh, application, um, as, I will, as I'll tell you. Um, so that's where we're going to end up, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom out a little bit and give you more of a general introduction about plant biology and the potential of plants um, in, this, in this context. Um, most most people don't really think about plant biology or plant plants so much when it comes to discussion of, of medicine and biomedical science and and many of our students here at the university also they, they think of biology they want to study neuroscience they want to study medicine they uh, don't think so much about plants and so all of us plant biologists and plant biochemists have a bit of a chip on our shoulder I think about this um, so I'm going to start out by putting in a plug for, for plants, and really there are two super important, very large, major points I want to, I want to make um, about, about plants and, and their capacity, and then we'll end up with uh, the application that I, that I just mentioned. So um, plants are the world's best chemists. That is one of the, kind of the foundations of how I think about plants, and that's really in the context of the numbers of really powerful and useful compounds that plants can make. Um, you'll recognize some of these. Morphine is still widely used and the most effective uh, painkiller. And it's still cheaper to grow opium poppies and extract it um, rather than synthesize it chemically. Other 
kinds of compounds um, like these vinblastine compounds that are anti-cancer drugs are are um, not possible to synthesize. We haven't figured it out yet. Or in cases where we have understood biosynthesis, it's actually still cheap to grow the plant. So, so the these are very you know three three examples of very potent compounds that you might recognize and you might recognize those those plants. Um, and you know really plants and plant biochemistry has had a long association with with humans um, culturally. Um, you know medicines, drugs, spices, flavors, all of these things are a testament to the incredible biosynthetic capacity of, of plants. So they really are the world's best chemists and in another way of looking at them, they really are biochemical factories. I'm not going to be talking about these specific compounds, but that is just to provide a bit of a, of a, a context that, you know, why we should really consider plants as, as super important when it comes to any kind of a, um, uh, yeah, biomedical and, uh, and medical, medical issue. So this is one big feature of plants. They really are very, very good chemists and they're biochemical factories. The second really important thing that applies more directly to um, to to our topic today is um, that plants can be genetically modified, and so we can take foreign DNA and insert it into plant chromosomes and plant cells. Um, and for a number of plants, this is actually relatively straightforward, um, and it's certainly a whole lot easier than for um, than for for animals. And um, so this has been now a technology that's been that's been around for for many years, and it's seen lots and lots of applications. Um, and uh, you know, there's some some things that I'm sure you've you've all you've all become aware of. Um, you know, we can we can use we can genetically modify plants. Um, you've heard of CRISPR, perhaps, and so now this has become possible to actually edit or edit the genome, knock out genes. And you know, we haven't really seen applications in terms of. Um, agriculture and, and sort of GM products yet, but this is happening very soon. And I think in the next few years, we'll see a big, a big push for, for these kinds of, uh, these kinds of plants. Um, you're all aware of the, the genetically modified crops that are out there. Um, we can insert new genes into the plant. So some of these could encode for herbicide resistance. And you've, I'm sure you've, many of you will have heard of Roundup and Roundup resistance and both the good and the bad on, on that context. But most of the, the, the canola grown on the prairies are very much of it is, is, uh, herbicide resistant. We have genes, of, you know, scientists have inserted genes for, for pest resistant BT toxins, a good one. So we can, we can put in new genes fairly readily into plants. And uh, as mentioned, in terms of agriculture, um, there's been many applications and a very large percentage of certain crops such as canola and soybean is in fact genetically modified. So this technology that, that, um, that is very, um, very widespread now, um, Another application, though, of, of genetically modifying plants or inserting DNA into plants is that we can it, we can express um, animal uh, genes, human genes, viral genes, um, with uh, with other properties into plants. In this case, pharmaceutical and and uh, therapeutic relevance. So this includes uh, things like uh, um, mammalian growth hormones. Um, this in, includes um, compounds for vaccines that we can make um, in, in plants. And so all we need to do is have the gene and uh, convince the plant to produce it in order to uh, and then harvest it and, and purify it. And that's really the crux is to then once you have a, a, a foreign, a novel protein, um, then to purify it from the plant um, and um, and characterize it to make sure it's exactly the same as an, as, as an animal's. So some examples of how we can use the ability of plants to be genetically modified um, for some, some very important um, applications. And of course, when we're talking about uh, COVID, that's where we're going. And this, this last point um, is, is called um, molecular farming. So growing crops, growing plants with the idea of producing pharmaceutically um, important compounds. And of course, in the, um, in the fight against COVID and the pandemic, um, it would, of course, be extremely useful to be able to produce the SARS-CoV-2, so that's the, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, to produce proteins um, in the fight against, um, against, uh, against COVID. And so that's what I'm going to be telling you about, what we're trying to, how we're thinking about this and how we can apply some of our knowledge um, in, this, uh, in this fight. 
Um, so before, and I guess I should say that in, in terms of in terms of the the, the SARS, um, the COVID uh, uh, proteins, it, with within a matter of, of a month or two, the the genome and the, the the virus was sequenced. So we can make proteins once we have the genes, and so that's that was available almost within weeks of, of the first publications of uh, a description of the of the virus in China. Okay, I just see I put a typo in this, so my apologies, but <laughs> I thought I'd give you a bit of a primer on how we genetically modify plants um, and how this is done in a, in a, in a, in a setting. And in fact, we, we do this in my research lab uh, fairly regularly. I have a number of students and, uh, that have done this. In fact, undergraduate students can be trained to, to do genetic transformation of plants. So genetic modification and, gen and transformation are kind of the common terms that we, we use. And again, um, sorry about that, um, the typo there. Last minute uh, changes to my, to my slides this afternoon. Uh, so how, do, how does this work? Um, genetic modification or transformation was actually invented, quote unquote, by a, by a soil bacterium. And uh, this is one of the most remarkable discoveries in, in plant biology um, a number of years ago now, um, that there is a bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens, which is a soil bacterium that people didn't really pay too much attention to. It is a pathogen um, and it produces a a, a disease called crown gall disease, and that's kind of shown here. Um, can can people see the cursor, John? Can you see the cursor if I move it? Yes, we can, Peter. Okay, excellent, excellent. So here's a here's a cartoon of this um, of this uh, pathogen, a bac pathogenic bacterium, um, and it has a chromosome or most of the DNA. It has this small little little uh, loop, a little circle of DNA called the tDNA. Um, or, or transfer DNA, and um, and on a uh, no, the, the circle is called the TI plasmid or tumor-inducing plasmid. And so what happens is that this bacterium infects a plant, it gets into a wound, and it makes its living by producing these galls. And it makes those galls by transferring some of its DNA, the tDNA, into the DNA of the plant cell. And those plant cells then grow, and they form this tumor-like thing here called the gall or crown gall. And this is where the, the infection first took place. So the ba bacteria, the agrobacterium, discovered, if you will, or evolved, of course, this capacity. So it's really, really remarkable that a bacterium could genetically modify um, a plant under natural conditions. And this happens in, in raspberry fields, raspberry crops um, that, that have some, some wind damage or some wounding and the bacteria get in there. Um, so all of our, or much of our trans ability to transform plants has actually been, been to co-opt this bacterium and to use it for our own purposes. And that's what plant biologists have done for the last 20, uh, over 20 years, 30 years, um, modifying this bacterium, harnessing it, harden, harnessing this ability to put DNA into a plant cell. And so all we then have to do is take another gene, we take out this tDNA or modify it, and we splice in a gene that we want to put into the plant and we put it back in the bacterium, and then we in inoculate plants with this bacterium, and we've made some other modifications that allow us to then not produce a gall, but to produce new plants that all carry this, this novel gene. And this gene could also involve something to do with CRISPR, so one could do some, 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 some editing and, and so forth. Um, but for what we're talking about now, it's really just putting in new genes that then lead to new proteins in the, in the plant. So bacterium, agrobacterium, was was the, the source of, of a lot of our, our technology for this today, and we're, we're using it as plant biologists um, for, of course, very, very different purposes. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna walk you through kind of how we do this in, in, in my research lab um, to show you why we're not using this in the, in the, in the, in the pandemic and the COVID, because it's very slow, as you'll see. But it gives you some sense of how we can, we can use the power of agrobacterium to, to, to modify plants. And it gives you a bit of a sense of how it works in a, in a lab. And so we start with the bacterium, the agrobacterium, where we've, we've removed the, the, um, the tDNA, or we've substituted with a, with a gene of interest. This is a peachy plate, so it's about this big. And um, we've got little pieces of plant tissue in there that have been infected with a, with a bacterium, and then we select them with you know, various antibiotics and molecular tricks in order to um, find and, and promote those cells that have, have received the foreign DNA. And so this is kind of how it looks. So we start with these little, tiny little clusters of, of cells, 
and you know under the right conditions we add a few hormones we can get these are undifferentiated cells a mass of plant cells and every once in a while we can coax one to make a little shoot make some leaves and so we then we take those and then we we um how we, we move them to new feature dishes we have little clusters of, of tissue and lots of little shoots you can see coming up here and uh, this takes you know this is a matter of weeks and months um, and we keep subculturing and, and keep you know excising we'll take some of these shoots put them in a new a new medium uh, brought another one here and i it's too bad i, I can't see what, what you're seeing but hopefully you can see a little jar with some little platelets in there so this is kind of an intermediate stage where we've, you know, we've got plants. They've um, they've been transferred from the petri dish to this box, and uh, they can they, they're growing now in in still a it's like a three dimensional petri plate if you will if you will a box that's still sterile and with, with nutrient medium, and that's kind of an intermediate stage in the in the process, and and from there we um, we we move into a a very moist mist chamber. We convince you know we kind of have to harden off the plants a bit, and then ultimately in the greenhouse they look like this. And, and so we've gone through a whole cycle here, um, and it really is a very slow process. It takes 12 to 18 months. It's, um, as I said, it's, you know, it's, it's nice to have students that have a bit of a green thumb that can do this um, because it does take time. It takes a bit of judgment on these, but it's not, it's not that, that difficult. It's just you have, to, you have to develop a lot of patience to be able to do this. Um, so this has been something that we've been doing in my, in my research group for, for many, many years. And as I said, I've, I've had multiple students that have, have gone through this. And we, we do this in order to test the function of genes. We're not trying to create any monsters, any new, new plants that we're going to release. But we're, we're testing the functions of genes using this kind of approach. OK, um, so I'm going to actually I'm going to have a drink. Um, excuse me for one second. While you're having that drink, Peter, I can just um, let you know and the audience know, um, everyone can actually see a little insert of you speaking. And just so you know, if everyone clicks on that while you're speaking or showing any of your props, they'll actually get, they'll actually see you on the full screen and then they can toggle back and forth between that and your presentation. So that's what I've been doing as you've been showing this. Oh, yeah. So if I show this thing, you can all click on it and then you can get a close up. Yeah. So. If everyone does that, click on the little picture of um, Peter. He'll then fill the screen. And so, yeah, we can now see it perfectly well. You're full screen. OK, OK, awesome. That's, uh, that's good to know. Yeah, and then we can just go back to your presentation just by clicking on the other window. Yeah, I've been, I've been using Zoom a lot, so I've got the reflexes for Zoom. So this is a little bit new for me. Um, no, you're doing a great job. OK, excellent. Yeah, just let me know if I'm walking off the, <laughs> off the screen or something. Um, what I want to talk about now is actually I put a little pause in here because I want to, to explain a little bit how then we came up with this new project, which has to do with, of course, with this plant, which we haven't really worked with a whole lot. We we have had done a few experiments with this with this Nicotiana plant, and um, I think I want to tell the story because I think it really illustrates super well the synergy of the mission of the university to combine research and teaching because we came up with these ideas really in the process of of teaching. I was I was preparing. One of my last lectures in March um, for plant physiology, it's a th third year course that I teach. And um, that's when the pandemic hit and we just switched to trying to figure out how to teach online. And I was, I thought, well, I've got to do something relevant. So I, I, I had a little extra lecture in the, at the end of the course and I, I did a, a lecture on, I want to do one on molecular farming, which is what I just explained is like the idea of using plants to produce pharmaceutical um, proteins. And I started looking around at, uh, some companies and and, uh, and and other institutions that were doing this, um, doing taking this approach, and I came across a um, a company I'd heard of. I'm going to write this on the board. This is another sort of a blackboard experiment here, so um, bear with me and let me know if it's if it's not visible. I don't know if people can see that, but it, it says Medicago. Um, and that is actually a, a company in Quebec that that um, that has been using this kind of a, a technology, um, in fact, to to produce uh, antiviral vaccines, HIV, and others. And they had just started thinking about using this against the the the, the COVID um, um, in the COVID pandemic. In fact, they were on. There was a big piece on CBC News last night on this very company in Quebec. So they're thinking about the same thing. And I got the idea. Well, we can you know we can try to to do a little piece of that. Um, right here in, in, um, in um, you know, I, actually I wasn't even thinking about it. I, I was just working on the lecture and I sent it to one of my students and said, hey, this is kind of a neat little little thing that, you know, what an interesting way to, 
to use plant biology in, in the pandemic. And then he, uh, he was one of my graduate students and he immediately sent back saying, oh, we should do this. And he was very enthusiastic. And it led to a whole bunch of discussions, conversations, discussions with companies that are actually working on, on test kits. And then we realized we can get funding and we can actually try to do some of this. And so, again, I think it was just really cool because I was, it was, uh, you know, teaching and research really developing a, a very nice, a nice synergy, and it doesn't always happen that way. So, it's it's kind of neat. Um, so yeah, so we, we thought, well, we can probably figure out a way to make make proteins in in plants and all sorts of proteins. And uh, what do, what what do we need to be able to apply to to something like a pandemic? And the, the two big things that of course we we need is, and you hear about this in the news every night, is you know, of course, a vaccine, which is now now happening and it's rolling out, and you know, and slowly but but steadily um and the other thing that's really important is kind of the public health side or just controlling infection and infection rates is rapid testing capacity that we can then of course isolate and so be able to do rapid tests is a is a, is a really important uh, um, important technology and this is where i thought that perhaps we can make a contribution because the vaccine business of course is a, is a huge and, and cumbersome cumbersome uh, enterprise um so there are different kinds of COVID tests, and I'm sure we've, you know, most of you are, are familiar with them. Um, the most common one, perhaps the most rigorous, the, you know, the, the gold standard in many ways is to detect the RNA, um, you know, with the nasal swab, the swabs, and the polymerase chain reaction, just a molecular tool that we can then very specifically identify a piece of RNA or, or DNA, and that tells us if somebody is, is infected and is carrying the, the virus. Um, but that's only one, one approach. Another approach is to, you know, that's, we could test for the viral protein. So the virus has RNA in the middle, has a protein shell. And if we can figure out how to detect those proteins, that's uh, perhaps another way to do it. And, and there are approaches to do this, for example, in, in saliva, taking saliva samples and looking for those proteins. Um, but to find the protein, you need a, a specific antibody. I'll talk a bit more about the antibody in a second, but you'll want to have an antibody and uh, that is, of course, um, quite, um, you know, those are very, very expensive and not always available, especially early on in the pandemic. Um, and then the other approach that, that we thought that this, you know, that, that will be very, very interesting to, to think about and that our project would kind of work into is to, to look for, um, to, to, to think about serological tests. So another way to, to, to another type of test is to identify infections current or especially previous ones, if somebody's had COVID, one can, one can detect this by looking for antibodies in their serum, in their blood. And the, the advantage of this kind of a thing is, of course, that it's, it's much easier to, to take a, um, a drop of blood um, and, um, and then develop a, a test kit um, that could give a result in, in, you know, in minutes um, rather than having to go to a lab and to do a compl complex molecular analysis. So, the idea is that um, if you can detect an antibody in somebody's somebody's blood, then you know that they are infected or they were infected. Um, it has a different application from a test such as the PCR test, but it's a it's a still a very a very powerful um, a very powerful uh, test. You can tell if um, it's also super important in trying to understand how vaccines are working. If we can look for those antibodies, so of course you know we produce antibodies. The body produces antibodies that very specifically recognize foreign proteins. In this case, we're talking about viral proteins. And, uh, you know, the amazing thing really is that they are super specific. Um, so it, you know, an antibody in the blood, it, it has to be specific for that foreign invader and not for something that is part of the body. And so the antibody has have, have evolved and it's incredible specificity. So they're very specific. You have a, you have an antibody and it's like a, a hand and a glove for the, um, for the protein um, and even just a part of the protein. And so the idea is that if we have the protein and we can make lots of protein in the plants, then if we incubate those proteins with, with serum, if there are antibodies in the serum, they will find that protein, they will stick to the protein that we've, that we've got in our test kit and that will then allow us to identify those antibodies. So we're essentially using a, you know, the, the, the idea is to use a protein that will then capture antibodies in serum and then we can we can detect that interaction um, i should say that we're really only working at the, at the first part of this which is to, to produce the protein and in order to have widely available test kits to have widely available and, and cheap um, uh, yeah, antibody tests one would need a lot of of 
specific viral protein, meaning COVID protein. So we have to produce COVID protein for this to work. And the beauty of doing it in plants is that it is in, in principle really scalable and we can grow whole greenhouses full of such plants to produce large amounts of, of, of these specific proteins. Um, and the protein that everybody, including us, is focusing on is, of course, the spike protein. We've all seen hundreds of images, usually as cartoons, um, of these little spikes. Um, you know, these, they're called coronaviruses because of these spikes on the outside, and that is the spike protein. And that is the one that, that um, most of our antibodies actually react with or the ones uh, during an infection. So it's a, it's a really good target for trying to identify the antibodies. And so the question that has become for us really, can we produce this spike protein, not the virus, just the spike protein in plants? And if we can do that, then we could purify it and then we could pass it off to somebody that can then build test kits um, out of it. So that's been the, that's been the project. Um, and when we started, nobody else had, had, had been doing this. Uh, recently, there have been two reports of, of um, other labs um, having, being, having successfully produced um, the, the spike protein um, in a plant. So I think we're on the right track. Um, we're just a little bit, um, you know, we're, we're, we're still working on, on, uh, on, on the, the, the final steps, unfortunately. One of the, 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 um, the big breakthroughs really in our thinking and in, in, in the approach has been to, to, to use a, a different kind of agrobacterium mediated transformation. And um, that's why I explained a little bit about our other method, which is really quite laborious and slow. It takes a long time because um, the method that I'll, I'll be explaining that we're using now with our little tobacco plants um, um, is, uh, is called um, agro infiltration. So really what we're trying to do is take our agrobacterium now we have a you know this is a lab strain so it's it's not going it, to it's it, this arm is not going to escape and it's amenable to growing in the laboratory um, as mentioned that you know the, the the genome of the virus was released in last January a year ago very very quickly so we know the DNA sequence of the entire spike protein um, it's a it's a very large protein actually with different parts different domains that don't matter too much and except for this part, this is the, the part that sticks up on top, and I'll get back to that, the receptor binding part. So we can, we can obtain this gene, one can get it synthesized, and one can, can copy it, and we then insert it into this agrobacterium that we have in the lab. And then, of course, the challenges, and in fact, this is the, you know, the first challenge was just to clone this, this gene and get it into the agrobacterium. And now our, 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 uh, our challenge is to figure out, well, how do we get this expressed in the plant? And how do we get the plant to take that gene and then to make the protein that we can then, then harvest? And so I'm going to show you this little technique that, we, that um, we're adapting that you know, we didn't invent, but it's been, it's been around. Um, and that involves this thing that I just mentioned is called agroinfiltration. So we take our lab strain with a, with a gene and we grow up in large, in large amounts. And so this is in the lab. I hope this works. This is my little movie. Uh oh. <laughs> I think it's a slow motion. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I want to go back to that slide because it might crash this whole presentation. <laughs> What we need is a large volume of, of, um, of uh, agrobacterium culture. So what you saw there are flasks that are shaking at about 100 RPM. Um, and I, I don't trust the, the, the computer to, to, to be able to run it at this, moment, at this point. Um, so we need a large volume. That was kind of my point. So we need a large volume of this soup, this, this, uh, this agrobacterium um, suspension. And then what we do, we take those plants, and this really is not rocket science at all. We take these plants and we put them inside, um, in, we dip them in the solution upside down, so be careful that the whole plant doesn't fall apart. And this whole thing happens inside a vacuum chamber or a vacuum, a vacuum a chamber that we can then, then, then push the vacuum out. So we got the plant here upside down in this vacuum chamber. I've got one here just for fun. I brought one in, so it's not very big. It's just a, you know, basically a, a plastic pot with the lid and a, and a tap on it. Plant is in there for a couple minutes and then we apply a vacuum with a vacuum pump. And so we basically suck the air out and then the solution gets pushed into the leaves of this plant. And one of the reasons this method really only works with, with very few plant species, this one is the best one, 
um, is something to do with the intracellular spaces. So the air spaces in the leaf seem to be very amenable to this. So we're sucking all these agrobacterium, um, agrobacteria into the inside of the plant, you know, millions and millions of them. Those agrobacteria are carrying the gene for the spike protein. Um, and uh, hopefully they will then express that gene and make the protein. And that is, that's, that's how we're going about this. Um, it's a bit of an operation just because we have to do lots because it's not always consistent and sometimes it works for some plants better than others. The size of the plant, the, the age of the leaf, all that kind of stuff is really important. Um, but if it works well, then you get a plant that looks something like this. You can see the leaf is, is a bit, it's a bit uh, mottly and it's dark um, where the liquid has gone in. So this has now been infiltrated with, with these, uh, these agrobacteria. And then it's a matter of going back and letting them dry a little bit and they go into the growth chamber. Um, this is under LED, so it's got this somewhat eerie color, but it, the greenhouse would work just as well. You put them back in there and then we wait for three days, seven days to, um, to maybe about a, um, a week or two weeks um, for that gene to become expressed in the plant and the plant has to have some time to then accumulate the protein. So, um, so really, um, this is the, um, it's a very, it's a very simple method. It's amazing that it actually works. And in fact, we don't entirely understand how it works. So the actual infiltration is simple. The cloning, the molecular manipulations are a lot more complicated. Um, and so when I, when I actually, um, how do you, how do you know it works? Let's just go one, one step further. So this is a, this is an image. Um, it's kind of a test where we, we were just testing the method or it's like our positive control where we want to make sure that whatever we're doing is actually is actually working. And so in this case, what we've done, we've inserted the gene for a fluorescent protein into this leaf. So that glow, that is the light that's being emitted under fluorescence of, of with UV light. So there's a, you can see the piece of the leaf and it's being, um, it's, 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 uh, it's fluorescing. And so this is telling us, and this is not something that a normal plant would do. Um, so we know that we've created this plant that is now expressing this, this GFP, this green, green fluorescent protein. And so, um, so unfortunately, um, we know the method, you know, fortunately we know the method works. Unfortunately, it's still been, it's been a struggle actually trying to get the, the, the spike protein itself expressed. And so um, when, I, when I first agreed to this, this talk many months ago, I figured, yeah, for sure we'll have gotten some expression. And as it turns out, um, you know, we've, it's, it's been slower than, than anticipated. So um, we're working on different ways to actually get this to work with a spike protein or a part of it. So I'm going to explain some of the subtleties of this now, um, because there are lots of little tricks that we can do and that we're, that we're working on. Um, so here's a, here's kind of a molecular model of what this protein looks like. It's just a long folded up amino acid chain, different structures, coils, sheets, and so on, but it's a three dimensional thing. Um, and this is part of that, um, you know, this, this is a one spike protein in, in the virus that exists as a trimeric. So there's three of these together that form the little spikes. And they're essential for the plant to, uh, for, the, for the virus to infect a cell. In fact, is, this is the, the, the green part here is the, is the key part is the receptor binding domain. And so um, this is the part that allows the virus to infect the cell. This goes into the, you know, interacts with that ACE um, receptor you might have heard of, and if not, it doesn't, doesn't matter. But this is really the, the most important uh, part of the, um, of, the, of the protein. And this is the one that the antibodies really, um, during a natural infection, um, are, um, are very specific against. It's the most conserved part. So this is, the, this is the part of the protein that really distinguishes the SARS-CoV-2 from the other SARS or the other type of coronavirus. So this is a really important part of the protein. And so what we're now doing, so this is kind of the next approach and give you some sense of how we can approach this. We can then cut out this RBD. So this is the green part, as you saw up here. This is the, so this is a map of the, of the whole protein, right? From one end to the other, it's just a long, very long chain of amino acids. But we can, we can cut out the genes or the, the, the DNA sequence for just this part. So now what the, the next step really is to see if we can't, you know, if this big protein is too big to, to work properly. Um, what we've done is take this receptor binding domain gene and then try to express that in the, in the um, Nicotiana plants, as well as what we can do is take that and we can fuse it with a green fluorescent protein so we can put them both together to see, to see if that works. Um, so that's really what's, what's going on now. We're working very hard at this to see if we can somehow trick the plant into making this, this viral protein. We don't really know why it 
the plant doesn't want to make the protein, or at least not at high enough levels that we can detect. Um, there's other subtleties. A lot of proteins have sugars attached to them, um, and especially this one has a lot of sugars on it. And so if the plant doesn't quite put the sugars on the right way, maybe the protein doesn't get made properly and it gets broken down. So there's lots of things that we're, we're looking at now. Um, and hopefully in a, in a few months we'll be, be able to go to the, to the next step. Um, okay, so there's, there's another idea I thought I'd just bring up because we thought about this recently now that we know um, this, you know, in principle this can be done and, um, and thinking about, about future work in, in, uh, in a different application than perhaps using a, an approach to produce, uh, to produce another kind of test and I thought I'd just bring this up. So right now, what, what I've explained to you, right, is that you know, we've got an antibody and the antigen is the spike protein, right? We're going to make that in the plant. Um, and that's going to, you know, enable, um, enable um, a, a test to detect if the blood, the serum, contains an antibody, meaning you've been infected. You can do the opposite thing, actually. And it's amazing that this, this has been done. Um, it's also somewhat tricky. And I've seen publications where people have done it with, with this, uh, this kind of a virus. Um, is to go the other way around. Um, if we're trying to detect an antigen, so a virus in a patient's um, in, in saliva, um, then we need to produce antibodies. And it turns out that, that one can use the same method that I just explained, putting in genes for a specific antibody that, that's been, you know, antibodies that have been characterized that we know work with, with COVID. Um, we can then actually make, in theory, the antibody in the plant and then we get you know, cheap and abundant antibodies that can then be used to detect the virus in, uh, in, in a patient. So that has certain advantages. Um, it would be more of a, um, a test that allows um, for, I guess, you to distinguish if there's, if there's a current and ongoing infection as opposed to a previous infection. So these things do exist. I won't talk too much about them because I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, but these things are actually called, they're called planty bodies, antibodies make that plants. And, and it's a, this is a very cool application of, um, of this kind of technology. Um, one of the things I really want to, want to emphasize is, and, and why I love these little, these little tobacco plants, is that the whole process, once we have that gene cloned, is a matter of weeks, two weeks. In fact, in a week, we know if the experiment has worked. So, you know, the first set of experiments didn't work. We can, we can do another set of experiments. We can try another gene. We can another, try another combination of genes. We can be much more adaptable. Of course, at this point, you know, speed is, is important. Um, and so that's really one of the, the beauties of this, this what we call agro infiltration method is to be able to, to change and adapt very rapidly because it is such a, such a very fast um, method of, of uh, genetically transforming plants. There's other subtleties to it that I, you know, maybe we'll get to it in the discussion if there's some questions about the differences between this method and the, the previous methods. Um, but I'll leave it at that for now. Um, yeah, I guess I could I could sort of add to that that for example, if there's a new virus, a new variant that we need to produce a different kind of antigen, once we get this working, this means that one should be able to very quickly adapt to a to the new system, and that's in fact how these vaccine companies are doing it. They they um, they have a rapid system and they can adapt to a variant very quickly because they they've, they've already got the system um, set up. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna wrap up uh, right here. Um, I didn't write down any points on the summary and conclusions, um, but really what I wanted to say is that, you know, obviously we have a long ways to go. We're just kind of getting, getting going. And as mentioned, I'm, you know, it's probably not going to have a big impact in, in the current way, but the, the approach I think is really important to, to try to, to, um, to, to, to streamline and pilot for future applications. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, I mean, it's a privilege to be working in a field that has some relevance to the pandemic. As a plant biologist, I never thought I'd be doing this kind of work uh, even two years ago. And so I think that's very, that's very exciting for me personally. Um, and yeah, I guess as a, you know, and, and just to zoom out completely, I think it is, you know, it's a crazy time. It's a, it's unprecedented. Um, but, um, you know, that we've gone from the first sequence of the virus to, to vaccines rolling out um, within a year is, is totally remarkable. It's like a, it's almost like a miracle that things have moved that fast. And I think it's a, it's really the credit to, to the, to science and, and the ability to mobilize scientific resources. So I think that's quite, uh, that's quite amazing. And um, yeah, I think we should keep that in mind while we're um, worrying about all the other little inconveniences and things that we're, we're dealing with these days. Okay. I think I'm going to, 
um, just give some acknowledgements. Um, thanks to, to everybody for listening, and um, I look forward to some questions. And of course, thanks to my, my research group. Um, this is the, the 2020 edition, so you can't see any faces, but the two people that I've really been instrumental in getting this going as a postdoc, David Ma, and my, my student, Hardy, and uh, Hardy Gordon. And um, our funding has come from, from the federal government in the form of NSERC, and we have support at the Center for Forest Biology because we have lots of space to grow plants, and uh, we have good resources for taking care of them. Okay, um, should I stop sharing? Um, John? Sure, if you, or you can leave uh, if you want to. If there's some questions on the actual slides, um, I'm. Yeah, but uh, uh, first of all, let me say, Peter, what a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. I mean, this is the wonderful thing about being the organizer of Cafe Sci. I, I get to basically, you know, select this wonderful menu of scientific talks. And it's, um, it, it, this was a wonderful evening. I learned a lot of great stuff. So what um, we have a somewhat of a tradition in Café Scientifique that, um, of course, we can't give you a, a real round of applause, but I'm going to invite the audience now to uh, a mass virtual raising of hands. They all know what to do. <laughs> that will, uh, essentially, our, our virtual round of applause for you. Uh, let me know that you, uh, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe how I've trained everybody over the, uh, the the lockdown to do this. But yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Um, also, if you would um, like to uh, type a question into the chat box while Peter and I just uh, talk briefly here, then um, I'm very happy to read out your question to sort of moderate it there. So please get typing if you uh, have any questions you'd like to put to Peter. Um, and. Uh, I, I had there were so many ideas flashing through my mind as you were speaking, Peter. And um, I guess you know, I, I guess one thing is you're perhaps being a little bit hard on yourself because how did the the shutdown of laboratories at UVic kind of um, impact this? Because I imagine it must have been July, August before you got back into the labs. Well, exactly. And in fact, we. Um, I mean, this is actually one way to. Um, it kind of happened all at the same time. We got back in the lab in July in August and uh, then we, we we got funding, we started on this project. And so, you know, originally this was a way I thought, well, maybe we can, this will help us get back in the lab faster because we've got something that, that is, is really, you know, timely here. Yeah. Um, but it, it actually is interesting because early on it was, everything was very slow, ordering things, supply chains, um, yeah. ordering, ordering reagents was difficult. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, um, uh, and then of course, September rolled around and I guess you had to teach. <laughs> yeah, of course, they're professors we teach. <laughs> yeah, but um, I, I did have, whilst we're waiting for, for people to, to, to type into the chat, and, you know, uh, we a lot of our audience are regulars, and so um, they, they won't be backwards about coming forwards with their questions. But just while I'm letting people type in, one particular question I had was, um, so one tobacco plant, what kind of yield would you hope for in terms of how many antibodies do you think you'd be producing? How many tests worth of antibodies do you think you'd get out of one tobacco plant? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, it's really um, it's really variable. So you can get, you know, if this works well, you get a significant amount of protein. Like you get a lot, you know. Um, I couldn't tell you how much. I think um, it depends a lot on the kind of test that people are doing and. Uh, yeah. We were talking to a, a company in Vancouver that does like a one minute test for other other viral diseases and you know it's very fast but it requires a larger amount of, of, of protein but one plant yeah it'd be you know thousands kind of thing in that in that okay. uh, and I mean you would want to scale this up right so you could you could literally fill up the greenhouse right with with a bunch of these plants and then it's a matter of having the capacity to to extract and purify yeah and uh, okay so we've got a, a quick question here from Kathleen. Um, any chance the anti antibodies could form part of a treatment? I know that might be outside of your, you know, uh, expertise a little bit, but I'll throw that in there. In, in principle, I suppose, yeah, if, if one gets a, you know, there are, you know, the antibody treatments are often where serums can recover from patients, right? And they, they you know, they're, they're the kind of antibodies that will attack, that will, that will bind to the, to the spike part. Of the of the protein and then prevent entry into the cell. So, I haven't seen that in in terms of application, but in principle, um, 
it's it's uh, it is possible I, I think okay um, just while we wait for a, a couple more questions um, uh, I guess that one particular thing you, you mentioned struck me and uh, um, I'm sure many of us felt this in, in the UVic community, and it's perhaps interesting for the audience to sort of get a window into this, is I think many of us asked ourselves exactly the point you just said, how can we be relevant in the pandemic? How can we offer something positive? And um, it, it, it sounds like, you know, very much, it, how much, and uh, what I'm just trying to sort of get a sense of is how much of a pivot was this for your lab in terms of what you've been doing over, say, the past 10 years to what you've been doing the past year? How much of a sort of a realignment was that for you personally? Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, in terms of the technology, it's not that different because once you're used to working with DNA and plants, it's not that, dif it's not that different. Of course, the pivot is just understanding all the subtleties of these viruses and learning about viruses and how they work and the different, you know, the different aspects of those. <laughs> Um, yeah, of those, of those, uh, um, yeah, of those genes, I guess. Um, so that was the big pivot in terms of, um, it's, I, yeah, the technology, the techniques, you know, they're not that different. So I think it, it worked very well. It actually fit very well with what we're doing already. And it was mostly a pivot of thinking and thinking about this and realizing that we have tools in our lab that we can apply. Yeah. Now, um, I, I'm, I'm sure we're, we're perhaps not that different in terms of our, our career stage. Was it was it fun to actually be confronted with a new problem and realize you had the tools to actually tackle it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's just a thrill, right? And they say, wow, this is, you know, and it, it was it was such a funny experience that I thought, oh yeah, this is a pie in the sky idea. And as we talked about it, and as we developed the ideas, and as we got partners, I just realized, hey, this could be really, this could actually, you know, could actually go. So yeah, that was, it was, it was uh, you know, it's very neat. It's a, you know, it's great to be able to do that. Yeah, we just have a couple of more quick questions that I want to make sure we, we get to, Peter. So um, Scott was just mentioning that you've obviously advocated for plants as being very good chemists, but um, is there a, a, a plant's better chemists for this kind of technique than the animal kingdom, or are they complementary? Because we've probably all heard stories about, um, you know, uh, uh, genetically modified animal proteins as well. Yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of being able to um, to produce novel or foreign proteins um, or exogenous proteins, I mean, plants have the advantage of just that it's so easy to grow, and they're they're solar powered factories, right? Yeah, you know, they don't need much, right? Uh, and yeah. we can scale up easily, and we have lots of room, right? Whereas, you know, if you want to produce, you know, classically some kind of a fungal cultures or or yeast or something, then you need an incubator. You need like a big you know, um, a biological incubator to grow microorganisms, say. And yeah. so really it's the, it's these, you know, solar powered factories, really, that's what, what it is. Um, in terms of the, the chemical diversity, which is kind of a little bit of a, you know, a, a, a different angle why I say plants, are, you know, are, are the best chemists is, um, you know, their, their plants are limited in their ways, how they adapt to the environment. And so they, they adapt biochemically. And so they've solved all these problems that animals might, might, might solve with behavior or um, behavioral modifications, running away for a, from a predator mm -hmm. or a plant to stock it makes toxins, right? So the adaptations at the biochemical level. And so that's why we tend to say that, yeah, plants have just got much higher diversity of these kinds of compounds, medicinally relevant compounds. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are poison arrow frogs, for example, that also produce alkaloids that are very <laughs> toxic. And so there are pockets of this in the animal kingdom. So I won't be too chauvinistic about plants. <laughs> no, that was, that was a very clear answer. Um, maybe just a, a quick final question. Uh, this, is, this looks like more of a technical question, Peter. Uh, Kathleen was just wondering, um, you had one slide where you actually showed the, the 3D image of the spike protein. And she was just curious. Is there is that just an image you grab for the talk, or is there a particular visualization software you use? I mean, there, there is software for that where you could, you know, you can take software for these protein structures, and um, you could then rotate it in three dimensions, for example, and get a, a, a better, you know, manipulate it more and, and get a an idea, maybe make it interact with another kind of a molecule. But no, this is I just grabbed this. This is how it was published um, from yeah. one of the original reports. Yeah, and it's a. You know, at the biochemical end, it's a fairly, you know, I guess, fairly standard way to, to, sh to, to, to um, um, yeah, project a, a, a protein, what the protein looks like. And, of course, it, it helps us interpret how it works. 
Cool. Well, despite a slightly uh, shaky start, which I think was more my, my fault than anybody else's, we're just coming in nicely on time at seven o'clock. So uh, just to conclude the evening, Peter, I'd like to say, say on behalf of all of our audience, thank you once again for a, a wonderful talk and giving us a window into the journey that you and your lab have been on over the past few months. And yeah, we wish you the best of luck in the future. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, John. And uh, yeah, thank you to everybody for tuning in and for listening. <laughs>